And again, thank you, welcome. Uh, this is gonna be kind of informal, so if you have any questions, just stop me and we'll go over stuff. I got slides, but that's just to keep us a little bit on task. We can, we can, go, we can get, get off into the weeds if we want. Okay, so, .NET Core. So the first thing people wanna know is what in the world, why do we need it, all that kind of stuff. So that's my attempt to answer this. So what is it? <coughs> It's a cross-platform implementation of .NET CLR. Uh, cross-platform in this context means Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. It's meant to run on x64, x86, ARM32, and ARM64. So between those architectures, you should be able to target uh, any desktop or uh, mobile or tablet device. Uh, it uses the new Roslyn compiler, compiler framework. Roslyn, if you haven't heard of it, has been called the most advanced compiler built to date. It's pretty neat stuff. <coughs> Their JIT compiler is equally impressive. Um, and this is kind of a big thing. It includes the majority of the base class libraries. When I say majority, when they left stuff out, they're trying to only leave out stuff that is platform specific, e.g. <coughs> Uh, there's no reason to port over Windows Registry to a Linux box. There's no concept of registry. Uh, it wouldn't make any sense. But everything that does kind of make sense, they've tried to port it over. So that's the what. <coughs> um, yeah, let me make sure I'm not missing a slide here. Okay. So the, one of the, there's kind of three inspirations behind doing the core. Uh, one was to be extremely light. Now, if you'll recall, back when we did .NET 4, we had something called the client profile and then the full profile, right? That was kind of the first attempt at slimming down the dependencies required to run an app. They figured it kind of stinks that you have to have 145 meg download in order to run a little client app. So they split it in half and the client download was like 30 megabytes, which is fairly reasonable. And the um, server side was, was a much bigger download because it included things that normally you wouldn't need in the client, like the system web namespaces and uh, a lot of the serialization stuff and, and all that stuff you wouldn't really want in a client app. So uh, that was the first attempt, although it still had some deficiencies. For example, very few of my apps use XML anymore. But in order for me to ship all the XML dependencies, that alone is gonna be like 11 megabytes. <clears throat> so it's kind of more of a, why ship anything that my app doesn't absolutely need? So they kind of <clears throat> took a, an extremely light and a modular approach to the core. Um, everything is a NuGet package even parts of what we used to consider the framework. They're now dependencies as a NuGet package. So it's kind of cool that way. <clears throat> the other thing they wanted to make sure is that it was a very fast, very reliable, very compelling option for writing code. <clears throat> so they, they're, they're putting a real big emphasis on making sure that the code is quality on all the platforms, works perfectly on all the platforms, no unexpected crashes. Uh, their platform optimized JIT is not there yet, but it's really coming along, along and it's gonna be a first class com uh, JIT compiler for these platforms. And then the last thing is, because the way they're updating stuff, uh, they can ship major updates to the framework far more frequently without causing a lot of disruption. You don't have to go and retarget, for example, your app to, to hit this new framework. You can just update bits of NuGet packages as they become available. So it really helps the uh, life cycle of these apps. So that's kind of the approach. What did they, what are they missing? What, what's, what are the deficiencies? Well, <clears throat> the biggest one probably is that unless you're doing a console application, a ASP.NET application, or a Windows 10 UW application, uh, there's really no UI kit that's cross-platform. So if we're talking like desktop style apps or mobile apps. <clears throat> of course you can get some of that with Xamarin, but 
there's still kind of no, here we have this WPF style uh, toolkit that runs everywhere. There's some attempts to fill the holes, so I've, I've listed some of them here. Uh, for example, XWT and uh, Eto.Forms are two that uh, you kind of describe the user interface using the, this kind of uh, uh, non, see what's what I'm looking for. You, you describe the user interface using these controls that then translate to native controls later. So they're kind of cool that way. Um, but there's really not a lot of first class support and they're kind of a pain in the butt. And of course there's always those other things like uh, WX widgets, there's a port for .NET, you can use those. If you're not familiar with what that's, that is all about, uh, if you ever use Audacity, you've used those WX widgets. Um, Qt is another popular cross-platform framework. Um, I'm trying to think, what's written in Qt, Phil? Sorry, what's, what's written in Qt? Oh, Kylox is the first one that comes to my mind. People hated it. No. Um, I pretty much don't use anything else that uses Qt. <laughs> Paint Shop Pro, that uses Qt. Um, there's actually a lot that uses Qt. Yeah, GTK Sharp is pretty terrible on anything but Linux. <laughs> anyway, uh, next thing that's missing is AOT, AOT compilation. That is to say, uh, they are working on this. That is, <clears throat> they're going to may, be able to allow you to compile these binaries to uh, native targets such that you don't need the core CLR installed on the machine. That's really cool because <clears throat> it allows uh, allows you to use C-sharp for a lot of other types of development, including embedded development that has never been available before. <clears throat> they're also, uh, you know, based on, uh, still on this vein, uh, they're also trying to target LLVM as a back-end target, which would be really cool. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of LLVM, anyone? Just one? You two? Okay. Yeah, well, <clears throat> LLVM is, is a, the back-end compiler that's really catching fire. Uh, Mac, for example, now uses LLVM for all their backend compilation. <coughs> um, what's missing? Other languages like F Sharp. F Sharp's on the docket to come. Not quite there yet. Uh, and of course, like we talked about a little bit, platform specific stuff. Um, and <coughs> there's some stuff that we probably want back. While we probably won't miss Windows Registry too much, um, we will miss. Uh, tools are important for the platform, like uh, packaging tools and the ability to poke down into, p evoke into the native API stuff for the platforms. <coughs> Those will be nice to get back eventually. So, so they don't have p evoke in there in the .NET Core? I don't know the answer to that specifically. I'm just curious, because they did like <coughs> the, the old uh, you know, mono. So right. Like, <clears throat> so that's a, a very interesting question is people understand, or ask people a lot is, well, if there's mono, it's already cross-platform, it's already .NET, it's already got compiler, why do we need this? And I'd say the biggest answer to that is the class library that comes with it. Mono includes just a very small subset of .NET. <clears throat> uh, this is going to, uh, sorry, this is going to be a much bigger, fuller implementation. Uh, and another kind of cool thing about it is uh, if you target the, the core CLR, uh, because it's compatible with the full CLR, you could retarget it to full CLR, CLR and just run it there. You wouldn't have to install it if you didn't need it, because you already had the full. It, not the other way around, so it's up compatible. All right, so like I said, you can use it for basically three things today. You could use it for a desktop app or mobile app but you would really have a lot of work ahead of you to get in those controls working and, and things. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about these. Um, so we talked a little bit about this as well, jumping the gun here everywhere. This, feel free to ask questions, by the way. <laughs> uh, why do we need another framework? Uh, why not just use Mono? So the answer is, goes back to the, the values they're trying to, to get at. So for one, they want to make the framework more modular. Uh, so they can't take the existing .NET 4.6 framework and modularize it. It has to be a, a kind of a new effort. They are porting code from .NET, but 
they're porting it in such a way that it's all broken up and they're minimizing dependencies between these modules. Uh, why not use mono? There are a couple reasons for not, not to use mono. Uh, one is <coughs> the framework is more full. Two is the Roslyn compiler is far more uh, advanced, sophisticated, produces better output than the mono compiler. In fact, the mono is looking at using Ros was looking at using Roslyn and their stuff before they were bought. <coughs> Um, and the cool thing about having stuff broken up in NuGet is when I deploy a package, I deploy just exactly the binaries that I need to run this particular app, nothing more. So we're talking about major reductions in the footprints of applications. Why is that important? Well, <clears throat> has anyone ever heard of microservices? Okay, so just in a, in a few sentences, Microservices is a big new architecture, uh, and if I were to, to put it most succinctly, it would be this. Rather than thinking, I'm going to build this application that's going to be this for my company, it's more of thinking of uh, your application as a set of services. How do I integrate with existing other services that our, app, our company already has, and then how do I add to those that complement those services, and then as as a whole architecture, as a whole enterprise, as a whole system, uh, then it's going to accomplish the goal that I set forth rather than adding an app, right? <clears throat> so that's kind of a way to look at it. Uh, another big one is the cloud. So um, anyone heard of uh, containers like Docker? Anything like that? Yeah. So those are becoming really big and popular because those are the most optimal way to deploy these microservices. <coughs> and uh, these frameworks, when we put them in, in these containers, if, they're, if you had a 150 megabyte footprint just for the, the framework before you put any of your stuff in it before, that would be a really heavy, awkward, slow to deploy, slow to move container. You really want them to be light and snappy. So. Um, they're really not optimal if you want a really small footprint. Um, anyone here familiar with uh, the new feature in Windows Server 2016 called uh, Windows Server Nano? Yeah, so Windows Server Nano is kind of like the Microsoft answer to Docker. They are embracing Docker. They are embracing the concept of containers via Hyper-V, but they even went one step further and said, okay, I'm going to have this really tiny kernel that you can then add your stuff to and then run in Hyper-V as a container or a Hyper-V VM or whatever. Um, <clears throat> Is that just like the continuation of the old Windmill thing? Yeah, Windmill? except for they got the sucker down to like kilobytes. So they've got, and you can, and right now you can, if, if you did wanted to try it out, you can say, I want a .NET Nano and I want to do run a DNS server on it. Just one megabyte <laughs> container goes off and is deployed, and it's a DNS server. It's pretty amazing. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. We pretty much talked about this, but without even being on the slide. <laughs> Platform dependency is a big deal. Uh, one of the big things with the cloud is uh, there should be zero platform dependency in your code because obviously your code is going to run on commodity, quote unquote, uh, hardware. So it could be running on this machine for three hours of the day and then move, be moved over to this machine for the rest of the day or, you know, uh, and, and they have to work this way. Otherwise the cloud is, as we know, it doesn't work at all. So uh, yeah, so all this is, is helping get us to make better microservices that run in the cloud, so. All right, um, I guess the key takeaway from here is we got a lot of modularity out of this deal. Uh, we've got cross-platform out of this deal, and we've got better software for microarchitecture, micro so. All right, so let's get started. Let's do a Hello World console app. So, <clears throat> I'll do it in Windows first and I'll do it in, in Linux just to make sure there's no shenanigans. So let's just real, real quick open up command prompt. So let me do that. Oops. 
Try that again. Push the wrong button. Okay. So, it's kind of a three-step process. I make a directory, so hello console. I go into that directory, I say .net new, and you can see it created this new project. If I get directory listening here now, I see I've got program.cs and project.json. That project.json is like my uh, solution file. If I type them, you can see it's just a very simple uh, console.writeline, hello world, extremely simple bare app. And also, if I do project.json, oh, hmm, In momento. that better? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, guys. Okay. So, now that I've got a, a project here, I do .net restore, and it's going to look at my uh, project.json, see I've got these dependencies, got a dependency of a framework, and it's a core app, and platform one, so got my framework back, so if I do a list now, um, where did it restore to? Hmm, I expected to see something here. Oh well, let's try running it now. <laughs> so .NET run is going to compile it and run it. And there we go, hello world. Pretty awesome, huh? All right, let's try it in Linux. Oh, yeah. So if I come in here now, I've got a bin. It's going to be a little bit unexpected here. See what I got here? I've got a DLL. <laughs> yeah. But I can still run it. Uh, .NET run here should run it. Should run it. You know, I'm not sure how to run it once it's packaged. You know, this is the bin. You're supposed to package. So there's a package command. Dot net uh, package. It's not package. What is it? Publish. There we go. And that should be executable. So, um, but while we're here, let's talk a little bit about, about one of these others. Uh, the notion of unit testing is now built into the framework. Now they're not forcing you into their framework, uh, a la MS Test. Um, they're forcing the contracts, but all the unit test providers, once they implement those contracts, can use it. This is better anyway. Um, <coughs> MS Test is great for most things. I can do control RT and do test driven development it's quicker than anything using MS test. Uh, it, it's pretty good most of the times. It's big downfall though is when you go and try and run these tests outside of the IDE and realize that you're pretty well hosed. <laughs> and that story's only gotten worse over time because they want you to buy the test SKUs of Visual Studio. So you can't even do things like test lists anymore. So is it still like, so I tried that. We started out using MS Test and then we had, we're trying to run it on our CI server and we just kept getting errors. That, so we switched to it. <laughs> yeah. It's got other shenanigans as well. For example, before it'll run the code, it actually wants to copy it out someplace and then run it there. And it forgets dependencies unless, uh, even dependencies are in your, your static references, unless you do some silly tricks to get them. And it sounds like it was like something about friend references and loading, things like the IDE. They worked fine in the IDE, but yeah. if you tried to run them out, they would all just 
Yeah. <clears throat> what a pain. Uh, but on the other hand, once these tests are written, end unit can't just use them, which is stupid. <laughs> so I think we finally fixed the test scenario around .NET, which makes me happy because this has been a big pain for a big long time. So <clears throat> yeah, I, I like the, the thought of being able to use MS test and IDE and then just end unit the tests on the you know build server. All right, so let's do this on Linux. So not only gonna, am I going to do it in Linux, I'm going to do it in Docker. That's how cool it is. Oops, pull up the same thing. I meant to pull up this guy. <clears throat> so I'm going to say Docker. Oh, OK. That better? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna say Docker. Actually, I'm just gonna push up because I have it right here. <laughs> so I'm saying uh, super user do Docker run interactive. I want a terminal, uh, and then this is the name of the image: Microsoft slash .NET, and I want the latest. Okay, and then I'm in. That was fast. I already had it pulled, so. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna go to some home directory here. So dot net, not not net, dot net new. Okay, and just like last time, I got this program.cs, which is just the same exact program we got on the DOS version. And I've got project.json, which is just exactly the same as the, the, the uh, DOS Windows version. And I can do dot .net to restore. And then finally, dot .net run. There it is. Same exact code. The cool thing is, <coughs> This uh, again, the base class libraries available for uh, this is are pretty extensive. So, I mean, I can do a lot more than just console. <laughs> I can do, uh, I can make web rec requests. I can, I can do anything. Uh, kind of exciting, uh, but also ASP is, is exciting. So let's do some of that. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to create. A, uh, a new ASP.NET application. We're going to run down and I'm going to show you all the things, how they're put together. Then we're going to start over and create it from scratch to show you how, kind of how it all fits together. So let's do that. This would be more convincing as a cross platform exercise in Mac and code or something, but I'm not going to boot into my Mac side. I hate doing that. And I tried to install Linux in my hypervisor and I got it installed. But I decided to do the separate uh, partitions for home and var. And that turned out to be a big mistake because my temp file filled up like that. <laughs> I can't do anything in there. And I've just got to reinstall. <sighs> so we'll do it in Visual Studio, shall we? <laughs> uh, I guess besides, most of us will probably be using Visual Studio, I assume. So, All right. So. Here we are, new core web application, .NET Core. Although you can see we have a core web application .NET framework. So this is my new favorite thing is I like the structure of the core MVC apps much better than uh, the old apps. So I think it's time, like any time you do a new web app, rather than going here, I would select one of these two because uh, like I said, the structure is better for these, and I'll, and I'll show you why. Uh, but then you can still do the regular whole framework if you needed to. Um, so that's cool. But we're going to do the core. So we're going to call this Hello Web. Okay, and we're going to tell it to give us a web app. Authentication, perfect. Okay. 
So there's several new concepts with these new project files. We'll have to go over here a little bit. Fortunately, their documentation is really not too shabby. Um, so first thing we'll notice is that uh, if I go here and I right click and I say open folder explorer and I come in here and I say new text document boom it's right there no longer do I have to say show me all files find the file that's missing right click add file it's it doesn't do that anymore it doesn't even track what files are part of your solution it doesn't matter it never has mattered so instead this does that you also notice I've got a project file that's an xproj. Well, let's look in there for a minute, shall we? They kept some XML. They finally put it back to XML. I don't know if you noticed this. I complained during the last presentation when we were showing the beta version. It's like, why did they make everything JSON just for the sake of using JSON? <laughs> We have a project file. It's not a CS project, it's just an X project, but that's fine. That works. That's cool. Yeah. It's, you can see though it's a very similar thing. Um, anyway, I just wanted to, wanted to show that off. It's like they read my feedback or something. <laughs> All right. Um, but you'll also notice there's no solution file. So it's interesting. You've got this global JSON kind of a solution thing. All right, so um, next thing I want to show you is uh, the project structure here. We've got um, this WW root directory, and you can see we've got stuff in here. Um, so this is kind of interesting in that uh, the code and the web assets have now been fully separated for the first time which again, I think is a good thing. You can see your controllers are code and they belong with the code, but JavaScript and CSS are JavaScript and CSS and they belong as web resources. So they're there. Um, so a, another thought on, or let's see, another caveat, another thing to point out <laughs> about these is <coughs> Uh, Visual Studio is now fully integrated with uh, a lot of open source tools that uh, are, have been, other languages have been using for a while. So we now have full access to Bower, Grunt, Gulp. Uh, of course we use NPM, we use NuGet. So we now have full access to all these. So just kind of another asterisk on here, <laughs> go down the rabbit's hole a little bit. NuGet is really cool. It does a, really, a lot of really great things. I think it's a really big step forward in package management. But one thing it's always done a really terrible job at was JavaScript libraries. JavaScript libraries have always been just kind of thrown in the scripts directories willy-nilly. There's really not a good way to integrate them in to the solution once they've been thrown in there. When you update them, it just creates a giant mess and you could wind up with code being deleted or lost or gone uh, or orphaned. So it's always been a big mess with JavaScript. Well. Honestly, there's packages that do a better job. NPM, for example, does a better job with uh, dealing with, uh, <sighs> boy, long day, huh? You can edit all this out, right, Phil? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, let <laughs> me restart my thought. <clears throat> uh, NPM does a lot better job with uh, managing JavaScript packages, just in general, does a lot better job with it. Uh, another thing that's interesting is <clears throat> before we kind of have to add build targets to get things like TypeScript to turn into JavaScript and package to minify and things like that. Well, those build files got complicated and or messed up and that stuff stopped happening and it was never really happening in a great time and great spot anyway. Well, we can use a task runner to do that, which is what they're meant to do and they work a lot better. So Gulp, for example, uh, and Bower, those are both examples of task runners. So they can do things like convert my less into CSS. They can do things like convert my TypeScript into JavaScript. They can do things like 
uh, minify and and all that all those things that we kind of hacked into the the previous version of ASP.NET we kind of have a better way of doing it a lot in it, better way of doing it now so uh, with those sides aside, aside <laughs> any questions about that so far <laughs> okay so let's talk about the program uh, one thing that's new as well is we have a program.cs in a web app with a main public static void main this has never happened to us before it's always been a complete mystery where <laughs> these applications used to start up. We're like, oh yeah, there's a global ASEX file that it may or may not be there. And then if it is there, there might be this function in it that may or may not be defined. And if it's not defined, go ahead and define it. But make sure you define it exactly because you're not really overriding anything because there's nothing to override in a global ASEX. You're not really you know, implementing an interface. There's no interface for global ASEX. Just kind of make sure it's typed correctly. You know, that kind of thing. It was ridiculous. Well, <clears throat> uh, that, that's all done and gone. And with that, we also got another added benefit. Rather than being dependent on system.web to bootstrap our ASP on applications, we have Kestrel, which is, uh, sorry, Kestrel is the free web server. We have, somebody help me out here. What's it called? Owen, thank you. We have <laughs> Owen. <laughs> as our middleware to help us start up our app and help us run it. So uh, I don't know if, how much anyone's done with like the, the, the latest version of ASP.NET before core, but it, it was getting kind of confusing because uh, Owen was in there and you could do Owen startup style stuff, but there's still global ASEX that's doing its startup style stuff. And then there's some things that are kind of a hybrid. So how do we bootstrap our stuff? Well, I don't know, it could be an Owen bootstrap, it could be a global ASAX that's expecting a, a app startup line in the <laughs> static config. You know, it's, it, was big, it was a big, huge pain in the mess. So now we have uh, a lot better way of using it. So this is a concept of called middleware. Uh, basically, we're going from a running execution in our, our, in our uh, host environment or OS environment and we need to bridge over to our web code, that's where the middleware comes in. So it does things like serve up static files, it does things like uh, the convention routing for MVC or the convention routing for web API. Uh, it will do things like dynamic stuff, it'll take care of things like security, it'll take care of things like uh, compression. Those kind of things all can wind up in the middleware. Uh, and you can think of a lot of interesting things to do in the middleware as well. But this is how we bootstrap in the middleware. So we just kind of use this fluent syntax to add all the things we want to add, and then we tell it to run. So you can see we're using Kestrel, which is going to be our web server. Uh, and we're going to say our content root directory, which is this guy, is get that. Then we're saying we want to be able to host an IIS. <coughs> They're saying we want to use this as our startup class, which we'll go look at next, and then it says go. So startup, is this is the next place, obviously, that we're going to have ha hit. <coughs> and what? Oh, darn it. Sorry. Let's see. 150%, is that good? Yeah. Yeah, let's get this out of the way. <coughs> So there is not always, but could always be <coughs> these methods in here. Now this is still a little bit magic, <laughs> kind of like in the <coughs> uh, global ASAX where you have to have a method named this and we're not really implementing an interface or overriding anything, whatever. But if we have something called startup taking this iHosting environment, then we can do something with that. If we have this configure services with an iService collection, then we can <coughs> then we get called in there. If we have this configure with these parameters, then we have a chance to configure there. So everything actually does happen in that same order. Um, the startup for hosting environment, this is giving us a chance to tell it kind of uh, how we want the web server to behave. So we're basically saying, well, here's our base path, it's content root. And I'm saying we have this app settings, so go ahead and read that. 
And, <clears throat> oh yeah, we have this app settings for the current environment we are, whether we're dev or prod or whatever. So read that and get the environment variables for the host because we might as well. <clears throat> and then there we have a configuration thing. Um, we save that for later. <laughs> Just so to have a peek at our uh, app settings here. So this has been going to be what's replacing our dot config files is these dot JSON files. And they have pretty much the same stuff. <laughs> Configuration, right? Um, but I do like that they, one of the big drawbacks we had with config files is it was a pain in the butt uh, when we had to deploy these because we need different config values for the different environments. <clears throat> There's one guy I used to work with who accidentally put the uh, test config in production and all of his production data wound up in his QA database and that was no bueno. <clears throat> There's no reason to make stupid errors like that. Uh, this framework should help us not make those mistakes. So I think this is really good because uh, there is, you all notice there is no app settings dot production in my project. It's expecting you'll build one there and that when you copy your project over, it's not going to wipe it out. <laughs> 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 All right, so that's what that's about. Um, this configure services. So one of the things that's now built into um, one of the things that's now built into core is concept of dependency injection. So dependency injection uh, has been a widely deployed pattern for a very long time. Microsoft has been adopter an adopter of it for a very long time. We used to use Unity, then later we had MEF that could kind of sort of do it. Um, but they finally broke down and made a real actual dependency injection container as part of the framework, and here it is. So um, this service collection, this allows us to add services. So I can add singleton objects, I can add transient objects, I can add uh, type resolvers, I can add, let's see, I'm trying to find more stuff. Yep, it's now part of the core framework. Which is cool because, um, like I said, it's been a long time coming and it's been a, a kind of a pain point, frankly. Um, Unity is really tough to get bootstrapped. I mean, it takes some time and dedication to get that in there. So quite frequently, it's skipped as a step for people do, to do for these projects. And, and never, no one ever comes back later to put in the dependency injection. <laughs> so having it done beforehand is kind of a big, big deal. So there's that. And then finally, we have the configure. And this is going to be kind of our last opportunity to put everything together. So. Um, you can see in here we're, we're configuring a logger, which also is another new concept is a logger is a concept that's built in the framework now, which is kind of cool. We can do different things if we're in development or in production. Um, this use static files means uh, it's going to just serve up static files rather than trying to process them. And then finally our MDC route, just like we'd expect it to see just kind of in a different place. But you'll, I don't have any app startup, right? Remember, if I do this the other way, I get this app startup folder and I get four or five files in there and then they all get referenced in the global ASACs. It's all right here. I mean, between the little bit of bootstrapping that has to be done in the, the builder and the startup class, that's it. That's all I should ever need. Um, so that's kind of cool. So let's go ahead and, and run this and we're just gonna like step through it and see, see this happen. I'm gonna add a caveat. So uh, these uh, projects start up a little bit differently than they used to. Um, basically you get to pick both the web server you're going to 
debug and run against, and the browser you're going to run and debug against. So you can see where I'd normally have Chrome set here, it says IS Express. So you have to <laughs> instead come in here and say, okay, okay, it's going to be Google Chrome. And then if I say this instead of IS Express, that's going to use Kestrel. So now I'm using Kestrel with Chrome. So let's do that. Okay. So you also notice it started up a lot quicker, right? Um, one of the things that we got previous was the ability to, uh, the fast startups, because it doesn't actually have to compile the whole thing before you start. So here we go. Go in here, host.run, and before we run, I want to finish the startup. So let's click and click. This big font is a lot harder. <laughs> okay, so. So here's Kestrel running. Another nice, nice thing I think about Kestrel is you can see I'm getting a lot of information on a console. IS Express, you don't get to see this except through uh, maybe in the output, but probably not. But there's a lot of good stuff in here. Anytime I hit anything, you can see every request. Look, it, at, someone asked for uh, an image, and here's the request. Gives us everything. Yeah? Nice. Okay, so let's go and look what we brought up. So this is the what page we brought up. Pretty nice, right? I have five it. Flip over. Oh, I can't have five it because I've got breakpoint. <laughs> well, I screwed something up. Yeah, I missed my other breakpoints because as soon as it said build, all that stuff happened. <laughs> uh, you know what? I think I know why. Yeah, I, I'm blocking this because I have the... There. <laughs> I clicked on it, sorry. Yeah. Let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So I just want to make sure I can see this side by side. So all my requests come through here. You can see everything that's happening. And then let's go debug it a little bit. So let's open up my home controller. And we expect the index to be run. There we go. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. So, how am I doing on time? All right. So, another thing I want to show while we're here is properties here, just because it's much different. You can see there's almost nothing in here. <coughs> All this stuff is gone. <laughs> Cool though, right? Um, by the way, these environment variables, uh, this is how, at least in Azure and uh, AWS, this is how uh, you are able to tell it parameters. So it has this uh, concept of environment variables. It's really just parameters that you're feeding the app. Um, so you can simulate them here. Basically, if it doesn't see development here, it's going to assume production. Um, let's see what else I wanted to show. Oh yeah, the .NET. So another thing we can see is in my references, I have the .NET Core as a reference. <laughs> it's kind of wild, huh? Um, and then in here, this is where, nope, not that there. Sorry, I didn't bring a mouse. This is all trackpad. <laughs> can you use my mouse if you want? That's all right. Uh, yeah, there we go. So yeah, so the core is just a NuGet, a NuGet package. Kind of cool. 
Uh, and so one of the questions that frequently asked is, can you use any of the framework in core? Why, yes, you can. There's a core edition of Entity Framework, and what's more is the core edition of Entity Framework always is going to be the edition of Entity Framework for everybody. So that'll be nice. Use the same uh, Entity Framework. I forgot to mention something in my slides, too. Let me go back and say, we can edit the crap out of this, right? <laughs> <laughs> We'll put my slide back on here and then have me say this. Another thing that the core is uh, attempting to solve is, has anyone ever dealt with PCLs, portable class libraries? Yeah, the core is a really valiant attempt at solving what we call PCL hell. <laughs> uh, the PCLs used to work by saying, I want to support this framework, this framework, this framework, this framework. And maybe you'd pick you know, Silverlight and .NET client and I don't know what else, mono. <laughs> uh, but then what happens is the project you get kind of gets the, the uh, intersection of all those frameworks that you pick. So you can't do anything unless it's in all those frameworks, which is obviously what you want in that scenario, but it's not ideal. But the biggest problem comes when I have this PCL uh, that requires dependencies so I'm going to go to NuGet, and I am going to find some other package to bring in and, and live with my package. Uh, the problem is, unless that package that we're bringing in matches our target profile exactly, it won't work. And there's been really no consensus on, hey, let's, hey, community, let's support you know, this profile. Profile 39 is one that was going to be popular. Profile 128 was another one. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's no attempt to, to kind of make all the packages the same profile. So essentially, you just can't use packages in PCLs very well. You kind of have to hack them in, and it's a pain in the butt. But now consider, if everything's targeting core CLR, then we just have to support core CLR. There's really not a lot of reason to support anything else because, I mean, we're not really doing Silverlight development anymore. Uh, this CoreCLR beats mono. I mean, we can just say target CoreCLR and it'll work for CoreCLR. And of course, CoreCLR targets the bigger CLR. Everybody's happy. So PCL cell, PCL hell effectively solved as soon as this is widespread. So it's kind of cool. Um, all right, before I start over with the new app, do we have any questions? Yeah. On the which ones? So I know that there's a, there's a new project type that was fairly recently released called .NET Standard. Is that what Core uses? Or so I think that we might have been talked about when we were looking at this earlier. Is that what you're talking about? So you can use the same format uh, using the full framework, or you can use it using Core. And it's the new uh, ASP.NET project type. <coughs> Sounds like what you're talking about, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I was guessing it was the project type because it, from what I understand, it's a replacement for PCLs. Oh, for, oh, for, okay. Uh, yeah, so there is a new type. I got it. I gotcha. <laughs> Here we go. Class library .NET Core. Um, if you target this, this is kind of like a PCL, uh, and it should work everywhere. Let me put an asterisk on everywhere. We're obviously no longer supporting Silverlight. <laughs> And we're, there's no longer a big need for mono, uh, yada, yada. So everywhere that makes sense. But it should work on mobile devices. It should work on, yeah, everything else. Does it support WPF? Uh, so back to my slides. WPF is not supported in there, kind of, sort of. It's not supported in a, uh, in a, in a cross-platform way, but universal Windows platform apps do use WPF for their uh, control widgets. So, so long as it's still a Windows app, then you can use WPF. If you're looking for a cross-platform app that's WPF, then you're out of luck. Other questions? Great questions. That is just... 
Let's give it a try. Well, mostly around packaging and deployment type scenarios. Is, so how, so if you're deploying to multiple different kinds of environments, so we have, you know, like our QC environments, which has one set of settings, and our stage environments <coughs> have different, dev has different, product. So we have tools currently that we run that actually because we have like different passwords that only certain people with right. access are supposed to, you know, so we have a tool that basically modifies the web config as you install into that environment. Kind right. Of thing. I mean, how we, how does that kind of stuff handle when you it just kind of <coughs> Well, so you saw that I had kind of a uh, start. I have a <clears throat> a builder here, host environment builder, and they're just kind of setting up this convention by default. So this is a really cool convention, and it works probably ninety percent of the times. But if you've got some other requirements that you need, just put it up here in the startup, and you can build your configuration any way you want, any way you need. So. It would happen there in the environment, but I mean, so you can still keep stuff secret. Like we don't, general developers don't know the product environment passwords. Right. right. I mean, <coughs> we don't want them as part of the solution or <coughs> acceptable. Yeah. So in that case, I'd create a file called app settings dot production dot json, mm -hmm. and I'd put it on product production, and I'd make it read only, and I'd revoke rights to users, but allow rights for IAS, and then no one can touch that file. <laughs> but you deploy on top of it, and I'm not going to be able to copy on top of it. There's nothing to copy. I don't have that file here. Uh, <clears throat> and then all the other kind of general non-sensitive settings can just live right. here. Using Slow Cheetah or something? No, it's a tool that I wrote a long time ago okay. before any of that even existed. Right. <clears throat> well, another thing, another option, you could make it into an environment variable. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just wondering what the, what, how this does it. Because yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll get it eventually get here. So. Right. Yeah, I, I think you're in a much better position because the config files were kind of a pain because of those things. And what's even more is. Uh, Let's say I've got a DLL that it needs some config that mm -hmm. I eventually wind up. This is going to accommodate that where uh, the config file system never did. I just have to go and find the pieces I need out of that DLL config, copy it over. What a pain. This can fix all that. So. <clears throat> what about like custom settings and stuff? Do you, does it support that? Yes, it does. Stuff? Because it's a, a JSON and because this uh, <clears throat> particular configuration uh, system is uh, very dynamic. You can just kind of go put in whatever you want. So if I wanted to add, for example, a let's see, make it in the right spot here. Um, Nate's password. <laughs> this is what happened when you put me on the spot, right? One, two, three. Keep trying. You know, whatever. <clears throat> then in the config system, as long as this is well formed, <laughs> I can just ask for that key, which is kind of even better because before we kind of felt like we're second class citizens being put in the app settings section. Now it can be full class. Well, yeah, we, have, we just created some like custom config sections. Yeah. Know, yeah. But I, I just was curious if that's still supported. Yeah, all that system is gone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You just or is it just all one big big file? Uh, no, I mean again, the great thing about the way they did it is that it uh, allows you to customize the stuff. The stuff was you can do whatever you need to. So, yeah. In fact, one of the first things I would do is I would change, add this a little bit to to help with DLLs that have config settings that need to come in. Say uh, for those JSON settings in a DLL, make sure that copies to output, and then it'd say you know. Well, that's exactly what the custom config sections we could have were for, like, some of our DLLs that have some config, and we put them in the web config, right? As right. Sections. And then you'd say config source and then another file? Yeah. yeah. Well, no, they were usually in there, 
Yeah. Oh. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. You must be doing the configuration for your company. Uh, well, <laughs> for our team, I do a lot of the release management stuff, but, as well as regular channel development. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's start over real quick here. So a new core app, and we're going to call this Hello World Simple. And then I'm going to say empty. <clears throat> and you're going to appreciate how much you really love those templates because when it said empty, it really meant it. It's still got the same stuff here, but you come back into here and there's no configuration going on here. And for this configure, rather than setting up MVC or something, it's just going to go ahead and, and return some content. <laughs> but this is good too, because then we can see exactly how these, this is, this is exactly what the middleware is providing for us, right? The stuff that's happening here would normally happen in the middleware, but instead we're gonna do it here. So let's, uh, Let's get some breakpoints going this time before I try and run it. <laughs> uh, you also notice I'm missing some of my methods, right? I got configure services, but I didn't get uh, the other config. What was it? Yeah, didn't get the other config. So let's put a breakpoint here and run. So I want to run Kestrel. Go ahead. Okay, so here's my configure services. Got a collection here. Another th kind of cool thing about the way this is working now is this is a, an actual collection, so we can see like what's in here. There's 14 st things already in here. <clears throat> so we got a bunch of singleton transient, so we got a logger factory going on in here. We've got object pools, we've got hosting stuff. So it's really, I mean, <clears throat> With Unity, that was one of my biggest complaints is you have no idea what's in the stupid resolver when you go to resolve. It's like, it's up, oh, not here. It's like, ah, I swear it was in there. Can I see what's in there? <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's that. So go ahead and continue. And then here's my configure. So I get my hosting environment back, which isn't going to have a lot in it because we didn't set anything up in the hosting environment. Not a lot in here. My logger should be live though. My app builder. App builder's gotten a little bit done on it. So, anyway, so then I can step through here. And finally, I run. There, so let's see. Did we just take too long? <laughs> yep, there it is. Okay. Hello, world. Yay. <laughs> so uh, I, it looks a lot like a lot more daunting than ASP.NET that used to be, but what you really got in the deal is a lot of flexibility in the way the stuff you're, you build is put together. And thank goodness we have templates because uh, putting all this stuff back is not easy. So, I mean, here, instead of doing this, oops, I really need a proper mouse next time. Oh. Instead of doing this, we'll have to do app.use and MVC. Ah, before I can use MVC, I gotta get MVC in here. So I gotta get the new get package. Actually, I'm not actually gonna do that. Because <laughs> I don't think it's gonna be very much use. But um, but yeah, I mean, I don't even have MVC in here. So if I want MVC or Web API, I've got to add a new get package. So, kind of cool, huh? I mean, is this a base build? Like, or is there a choice when you did it? I can't see this that far away. Is uh, there a choice for like, yeah. like so, building Yep, so I, I can choose empty or web API or web app. So, 
So when I do web app API, I get a little bit different bootstrap. But you can do them together again. Let's see, use MVC. In fact, uh, there's no difference in this version, as you probably already know, yeah. in, between an, an API controller and an MVC controller. They're the same controller nowadays. So, uh, one other thing I think I wanted to show. Uh, this is how we do routes nowadays. We, can you not see that still? Uh, it's not here. It's me. Okay. Um, we just kind of use it as an attribute on top of the class. Oh, yeah. So if we don't have a standard pattern set up, which this doesn't, then we'll just add these annotations and they'll just work. Yeah, so. Right. All right. Well, I think we're just about done here. Do we have any questions? I, I do have one more. Go ahead. Configuration stuff. So in you know current AI controllers, they have like this thing Mm -hmm. Does that still support it in this? I don't know. I don't think so. I think you'd have to. I think you'll have to BYO. <laughs> you know what? Though those weren't great I know, I know. because they were using the DP API and they they depended on the machine oh, keys and they were not easy to do and no one ever did it. Outside of you two, no one ever does it. <laughs> mm. Yeah, you can go look and see if I'm wrong on that. I hope I am. But I don't think they have anything for that anymore. Um, mm. Great. The great news is you could just encrypt the whole stupid thing and it'd still work fine for you because you can change how that brings it in. No, they were. I worked for United, uh, Optum, with Optum Insight, which is part of United. Healthcare, so it's mm. HIPAA. <laughs> it's like main doesn't crypto. Every day that goes by, um, I see the world becoming more and more aware of the need for encryption at every level. And I, it's been it's been years since I worked for anybody that would allow us to have an unencrypted web interface, or at least parts of it. Yeah, we don't have to encrypt every bit of it. We, we all know which parts we got. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've had a raw web config uh, for almost 10 years. I happen to know that most of the web applications you guys are running over there <laughs> don't have a convicted, con an encrypted config section. Not mine. None of mine. <laughs> oh, not the same thing you were. You're also the vast minority. <laughs> All right, um, I'm just gonna add one more plug. Another cool thing uh, about the new framework is they have webhooks natively supported. Anyone know what webhooks are? All right, so you know how like nowadays Trello connects with, Slack connects with, uh, Jira connects with everything. Everything connects together, right? The way they're accomplishing these integrations are with webhooks, and it's just kind of a fancy way of uh, systems being able to notify each other of certain events. Uh, and it's kind of a, an API style standard now, and it's supported natively, so it's kind of cool. Yeah? So I have a project, well, I may have two or three projects that I'll consider uh, these technologies for, but I'm going to have. I'm going to have someone stuff a technology on my throat, and if I want to find them and say, let's use, let's try it that core, I'm going to have to convince them that I can use the tools that they've spent a lot of money on to provide to me. So mm. obviously I can use Visual Studio. What other tools that are already in Visual Studio are going to help me work, are, are going to work with that core? So ReSharper, uh, if I'm targeting, uh, it doesn't matter what I'm targeting, most tools work with this, or do they, do they not know how to work with Well, I don't have ReSharper, and I don't plan to ever get it again. But <laughs> uh, .NET Core is where everything is meant to be going. I think I heard him t say one time, don't quote me on this, that there isn't going to be any more general framework releases as we know it. .NET 4.6.2, I believe it is, is the last. That's it. 
from here on out, it's .NET Core. Uh, so that's kind of the tools will eventually come this direction. Everything is eventually going to go this direction. It seems like just ASP.NET is the first to get there. So how about the language we're using C sharp? We know what we've covered what framework we're using. We've covered what compiler we're using. What about the language? What flavor of C sharp are we working on? It's the latest. It's C sharp six. Uh, and again, other languages are coming. Visual Basic's down on the list of, of little ways, which is, I think it's funny, F Sharp's now higher priority than Visual Basic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe we'll put it up on the website, but yeah. there, there's actually a, a lot of articles out there how to port your stuff into the core, so yeah. I mean, seriously, if I were to get a new project today and I were going to file a new project, I wouldn't do a classical ASP.NET 4.6.1 or 2 or whatever app. I would definitely go... I mean, even if I'm going with the full framework, I'm going to use this new project type and I'm going to use new tools. And there's probably no good reason to not use core. So I say probably. There could be some. Any framework still has a little bit of ways to come before it's fully supported. I might have a library dependency that doesn't support it yet. So there's reasons not to. But uh, that's right now, every day we go uh, from here is going to be for me, it's, you know, it's not the development side of it, it's, it's the whole deployment part that I have to figure out because we have in our tool chain that we have built around, you know, the old project files and, you know, doing some stuff that I have to look at. So. You'll figure it out. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. It's great. <laughs> Other questions? Anyone want to do a lightning talk? Great, let's do that. Uh, I want to use Nick. So I've got this language expression in there. And I'm asking myself, is there some way that the user could construct a Lambda expression and compile it and then have it run? Yeah, so there's an expression builder class that helps you do that. You can get that as a NuGet package. Also, we're using Roslyn nowadays, so you can take, uh, there, go look at uh, articles, you can take a string that's C sharp and compile it and run it with Roslyn pretty easily. Which is another option. But I think expression builder is probably the right answer for the, your question. All right, well, I'm done, so thanks. Thank <laughs> you.